pleasure to deliver this course to share my knowledge and experience with you and like I've mentioned I've been working in the field of conflict prevention and conflict resolution and conflict management for over 15 years now in various different contexts uh, around the world and so our aim for today is to go over some practical and applied tips that you can use right away in your own life to prevent and resolve the conflicts that you're currently facing and I would add to that and to assist others as a brave one to assist them to prevent and resolve the conflicts they are facing. So without any further ado then, let's get started here. Um, this is to help orient you to the, the uh, topics that we're going to cover uh, the next little while. And so really what I'm hoping to achieve here is to go over three major topics. Uh, first of all, I want to take a look at the conflict life cycle. And this is a diagram that's going to assist you to um, visualize conflicts and try to under uh, diagnose um, how serious they are, whether they are escalating and how quickly they're escalating. So part of that, the second part of that, is to recognize the signs of rising tensions. So um, different conflicts are going to have different uh, indicators that the tensions are rising. So we'll talk about that. That'll be the first topic we're going to cover. The uh, second topic that I want to look at covers nine golden rules for conflict prevention. So in the first case, we're saying we have to be aware that conflicts go through certain predictable um, phases where they escalate and so on. But then the second part of that is we have to know, well, if there is a conflict and it's starting to escalate, what can we do in practical terms to help to prevent the conflicts from getting more serious or becoming violent, perhaps? <coughs> Pardon me. So that's the nine golden rules for conflict prevention. Thirdly, um, and this is a huge part of preventing conflicts, is we're going to look at the importance of communication and how to improve communication in conflict settings. Okay, so <clears throat> um, what we're looking at here is a definition of conflict and not surprisingly <clears throat> different academics and different professionals um, define conflict differently so there's kind of ironically enough there is a conflict in the field over what exactly do we mean by conflict so um, I've shared with you on your screen now a definition for you to consider and it says conflict is an interaction between at least two or more parties that have perceived incompatibilities of interests. So anytime we have two parties each pursuing their own interests, and when I pursue my interests, it somehow um, puts me at odds with your interests, then a conflict is created. So let me try to give you a practical example of this. Um, let's imagine there's a big sale on at the mall, and uh, you're really anxious to go there and buy a new TV or something like that and you drive over to the mall and the park you notice that the parking lot is really really busy and it's really full so you see a nice prime parking spot uh, close to the front entrance and just as you're about to pull into it uh, someone else comes at it from the other direction and tries to pull in so this to get a little bit technical here this is what we would call a resource conflict there's one resource available uh, i.e. the parking space and there are two parties, there's myself and the other driver, and it's in my interest to get that prime parking space, but it's also in their interest to get that prime parking space. And so because our interests appear to be incompatible, they appear to be clashing, and there will only be one winner in that particular situation. Either he gets the space and he wins the conflict, so to speak, or I get the parking space and I win the conflict. So you can see how conflicts can sometimes be created by the conditions or the context. In other words, 
if there had been two parking spaces side by side, two resources for two people, of course there would be no conflict. Or if I was concerned about exercise and I didn't really want the parking space closest to the front door of the mall, I'd be happy to let him have it and I would drive around and take a further parking space, in which case again there's no conflict. So I hope that the idea is coming through there that <clears throat> uh, this is one of the most popular definitions of conflict, but if we break it down a little bit we see that there has to be at least two different parties and in a lot of cases I would say actually um, there can be more than two parties so you need to be aware of that going forward. Um, you might think you know who the main parties are um, and as you begin to have a conversation with the two main parties you might realize that there are other people who are also parties to the conflict that perhaps need to be involved. So we've got two parties, each of them is pursuing their own self-interest or their own personal interest and in doing so um, when they bump against another party that's pursuing their interest we can have a perceived incompatibility of interest which creates a conflict. Okay, so you might be asking yourself then why does he have uh, this diagram on the right with this funny looking <laughs> face and if you look at it one way um, he's looking, the gentleman in the photo is looking directly at us um, and if you kind of cover one side of the, the photo you can see that it looks like he's it's a profile shot and he's off looking to the side. So it's an interesting optical illusion um, and you might be asking why is that here? Well that's here because I want to highlight um, in this definition of conflict the word perceived incompatibility. Um, perceived of course is referring to the perception, someone's perception and we know that everybody in the world who we encounter perceives things very very differently. So you and I can both be looking at this picture on the right right now and you can see it one way and I can see it a different way. And so the interesting tidbit there is that sometimes we think we have a conflict because it's a perceived incompatibility between us but if we actually just sit down and talk and maybe share some more information we'll realize well we don't actually have a conflict because it was just a perception of incompatibility um, but we actually have many interests in common. So we have to be aware that sometimes our interests truly are at odds or incompatible with other people's interests and sometimes we just might think they are. So we have to be careful that we don't jump to assumptions and um, automatically believe we do have a conflict. We have to first of all explore that a little further and see if there is truly an incompatibility. Alright, so moving along here, <clears throat> the next slide is titled Conflict and its Prevention. And there's a number of bullet points around here on this slide that we're going to go over. So, it says the potential for a conflict is always around us. Not surprising because it's a clash of interest. So in any given time throughout the course of your day, all the way from looking for a parking spot at your uh, school or at the mall to trying to decide with your friends or co-workers where to go and have lunch to getting home and talking with your parents or your siblings or your spouse about whose turn it is to do the dishes, the potential um, incompatibility of interest occurs in all of those situations. So there's the potential for conflict. So as I mentioned before, conflicts can be caused by faulty perceptions. So that's where communication becomes essential. We have to share information. We have to say, you know, are you seeing the situation the same as I'm seeing the situation. Um, if conflict is all around us all the time, then maybe we have to consider the fact that conflict isn't necessarily bad. And if we jump to the next bullet point down, it says conflict if properly managed can actually lead to some good outcomes such as new ideas, 
greater team bonding and increased performance. So I'd ask you to take a moment right now, actually, and think to some of the conflicts in your own life that you've been uh, a part of at this point and, and think, have you ever, of course, you're going to have a couple of conflicts come up in your mind where the outcome was bad or it was uncomfortable, but try to think back to any times you've had a conflict where it was managed in a, in a, in a good way that actually led to some kind of good outcome. So what could happen is like if you're uh, at work and you and your co-workers have a conflict, if you have a good leadership and good conflict management skills in the workplace, um, what might happen is that you might actually come up with some interesting new ideas on how to fix some problems occurring in the workplace. And because you got through that challenge together as a team, you'll have greater team bonding. So the idea here that I want to reinforce is that when you think of conflict, usually what comes to mind is negative conflict, that conflict is a bad thing, that conflict should be avoided. I'm trying to make the point here that <clears throat> conflict can have good outcomes and good consequences if you can help people to manage it properly. So we shouldn't say that conflict is bad, but any violence associated with conflict, of course, is bad. So if we accept these ideas, then the next bullet point down says our overarching goal when we're thinking about preventing conflicts is that we want to prevent or resolve conflicts in order to effectively manage them without the use of violence. So we know that conflicts will emerge escalate and then de-escalate in recurring patterns and we're going to see that when we get to the slide with the life cycle of conflict and prevention begins with recognizing the signs of early tensions as early as possible or pardon me of rising tensions as early as possible so we want to be aware that there's the potential for a conflict and we want to try to prevent it from getting worse and leading up to a point of violence. So here's the conflict life cycle that I've been mentioning a couple times up to this point. <clears throat> you can see that it's got two main um, axes. So on the bottom, there's, uh, there's an arrow running from left to right, and that's the progression of time. And then on the left side, on that scale, we've got tensions running from uh, low tensions at the bottom of the arrow to high tensions at the top of the arrow. So what happens then is we've identified, or scholars in the field of uh, conflict resolution have identified at least five distinct uh, stages that conflicts will go through. So we have number one, the emergence. <clears throat> so there are some tensions that uh, appear. And then we have number two, those tensions get worse, they escalate. Number three, we have a peak uh, where there's a full-on confrontation or we might, we might uh, replace the word confrontation with violence. And then after the violent episode, there's a de-escalation of tensions and a, a stage of stabilization, that's stage four. And then we've got stage five, <clears throat> which is really low tensions again and that's a state that's where we would look to prevent the next round of conflict so you can see that the uh the conflict life cycle from stage five onwards show appears as a gray uh hump and that's because we can predict in most cases uh one-off conflicts are actually quite rare and it's more common for conflicts to go through a series of escalations and confrontations and so then we distinguish between um, preventing conflict in a post-conflict stage so stage five a conflicts occurred and we're saying let's prevent the recurrence of conflict or the next cycle of conflict versus doing early conflict way back at stage one and that's the ideal situation is that you want to say that um, the conditions are there for a conflict to occur and the warning signs are there 
and let's tackle it really early on before it has a chance to uh, escalate into a violent confrontation at stage three. The problem is that most people ignore the warning signs at stage one um, and they think that the conflict will just kind of peter out on its own or it'll disappear or I don't maybe I maybe I don't want to be bothered with this conflict or I don't have the skills to handle it correctly so what happens is that usually there's at least one or more instances where the conflict um, spikes and hits a stage three of violent confrontation several times and then the warning bells go off and then people get serious and then we say look at this conflict is obviously real it's a serious one it's been recurring what can we do now to prevent the next escalation of this conflict so we distinguish between taking conflict prevention at stage five where we've already been through one violent episode versus undertaking conflict prevention at stage one when the conflict has just emerged. And the general rule of thumb in almost all cases is that it's preferable to monitor and recognize the signs of a conflict very, very early on, so stage one. And in most cases, there will be um, some early indicators that a conflict is about to emerge. So one of the metaphors that I like to use is to think of a, a campfire. And if you're um, camping and you're going to make a campfire, um, you need to have a number of key kind of uh, things or, or ingredients to make the fire. You need to have good dry wood, small kindling wood that ignites easily. And you need to have some paper and of course you need to have matches so what happens is that all three of those things have to come together and a spark has to occur in order for the fire to um, to get lit and if you can recognize that this is a metaphor of course if you can recognize that in your family or in your community or in your workplace all of the components are there for a fire to occur or a conflict to occur um, but we can take really 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 early preventive efforts by saying let's remove the match or let's remove the dry firewood in other words let's remove the causes and the conditions that are going to create the conflict so let me just try to put this in some concrete terms um, let's imagine this is a workplace conflict that you're thinking about and let's imagine that the management team in the workplace has implemented a new policy and you recognize that the new policy is going to create new divisions in the company, therefore create a new conflict and that conflict will likely escalate. Um, so what you can do is you recognize early on that that policy or the implementation of that policy is a condition to create a conflict and it might just take one small thing to have the whole conflict quickly escalate and spiral out of control and if you can change that policy early on before that happens or, or put the shelve the policy or delay its implementation then you've effectively removed the conditions for the conflict to occur you've prevented that conflict because you were alert you were aware you were recognizing that there was um, something, some condition or some conduct, context created that was likely going to make a new conflict uh, emerge and escalate. Okay, so hopefully that idea is coming through that you want to try to ideally prevent conflicts before they even emerge by, at stage one by removing the conditions or causes of the conflict. And if that's not possible or you miss the warning signs and the conflict escalates, the tensions rise and then there's a confrontation, then you, then you say, well, let's do prevention at stage five. Let's try to prevent the next spike of the conflict. Um, the last thing I want to mention before moving on from this particular diagram is that you'll notice that there's no, um, there's no 
time markers provided here. So the idea being that uh, a this could all occur within the matter of minutes, depending on the particular nature of the conflict you're looking at. Um, you know, this could happen in the, this conflict and this whole cycle could occur within a week, within a month, or within a year. So if you think of some of the uh, some of the longest running wars that the world is facing right now, like say for example the war in Syria, um, you know that it's over well over five years, approaching six or seven years now, I believe. So the and the number of um, violent confrontations in that war are probably almost too numerous to really account for. But you know this same cycle, if you're looking at family dynamics, <clears throat> this could occur over the course of a weekend. So the idea is that when you go off and you apply this diagram and this thinking to your own work is you have to consider what the specific time scale is. Um, and similarly for the, di for the uh, axis on the left side for tensions, you'll see that I haven't really provided any concrete indicators of rising tensions. And um, again, you know, if you're looking at a war situation, the indicators that the tensions are getting worse are going to be different from the indicators of rising tensions, say, for example, in a workplace. So you have to take this diagram, modify it uh, to your own situation. <clears throat> okay, so carrying on then with that thought about the signs of rising tensions, um, here are some concrete examples I can share with you. Uh, they're not really context specific, so to speak, but they're just concrete examples of signs of rising tension. So, first of all, if someone communicates an intent towards violence, in other words, they're making threats, then you can say, okay, this conflict is, ser is clearly becoming more um, intense. It's escalating. So if you think about two co-workers, you know, if you know that there's a problem between John and Sue in the office and you're aware there's a conflict between them and you can't remove the conditions and you're trying to figure out what stage is the conflict at and then one of them starts making death threats against the other one, well clearly now this is escalating very quickly. Um, also arming oneself or otherwise preparing for violence is another clear indicator that the tensions are rising and that we're approaching the stage of violent confrontation. Fortifying boundaries and or digging in. Um, that's again another preparation for violence. An increase in hateful language. And interestingly enough, cutting communications. So sometimes we see this, especially in uh, the realm of international relations of world politics and international war, where two countries, um, they may have a diplomatic spat or they might have a conflict between them. And <clears throat> as the conflict between the two countries intensifies, um, what they may end up doing is closing down their embassies in each other's countries and, and withdrawing their um, ambassadors and closing down the embassies and cut in other words they're cutting off official diplomatic communications which are rather ironically enough is almost the exact opposite thing that you would like to do in a, in a crisis situation or in a situation of a, a rising conflict an escalating conflict because it's exactly at that point when more communication would probably be better and good, clear communication would probably be better. So in some ways, cutting communications from a conflict management and a conflict prevention perspective is not very helpful. It's not a good tactic. However, um, that's definitely a sign that if the parties are no longer willing to engage and communicate with one another, that their tensions are escalating and the conflict is worsening. And I would say that's probably holds in most any context, be it a, uh, a family mediation where, you know, the uh, 
parents perhaps are separating the husband and the wife and if they refuse to communicate uh, clearly conflict management is going to be more difficult and, uh, and and clearly it's a sign that the conflict is now becoming a more uh, severe okay well let's move on here so hopefully that gave you uh, a, a little bit of a taste of some conflict dynamics. I mean, clearly we could spend a lot more time on this. You could spend probably a whole week or more talking about the causes of conflicts and uh, how they escalate and so on and so forth. But I just wanted to give you some general um, concepts or some notions to begin with, thinking that we now know a definition of conflict and we know that conflicts will go through different cycles of escalation and so on and so forth and that our goal is to try to prevent them early on if we can. So now <clears throat> I want to shift from that to nine golden rules for conflict prevention. So what do we actually do to help prevent these conflicts from escalating? So number one, we know that conflicts are inevitable, but every conflict represents an opportunity for a positive win-win nonviolent solution to be reached. So the first step is that we must recognize this opportunity and then choose to take that path. This applies both to conflicts at the personal level, and I would add here to the community level, and also in the international realm. In other words, we need people to be peace leaders. So it's easy to slip into the thinking that we have a conflict here, this conflict is bad and it's gonna get worse, and the outcome is going to be bad and to slip into some very negative what we might call win-lose thinking uh, there'll be one winner and one loser but if we can reframe our thinking and our approach and recognize that conflicts if managed properly without violence are an opportunity for growth and development and positive changes and that we have to steer the parties down that path so they require someone to be a peace leader and indicate that that's a possibility and that this is a desirable path that you can and probably should take because of course the win-lose path um, creates one winner and one loser and that doesn't leave everybody happy so be a peace leader number two the overarching approach to conflict prevention is to remove the motive, the means, and the opportunity for the conflict to escalate into violence. So, I've already mentioned that conflicts are often caused by the context or structural conditions. And I use the example of the parking space, and I've used the example of the uh, lighting a campfire. And the idea is then if we um, want to prevent violence and we want to prevent this conflict from becoming a violent conflict, what can we do to remove the motive? In other words, what's driving one or more of the parties to pursue the violent option? And can we somehow give them an incentive to not use violence? So that's one kind of tactic you can take. Secondly, the means to use violence. Um, let's, hear, let's go back to a workplace example. So let's imagine then that you, you, you're the HR manager and it's come to your attention that there's a the conflict between, who did we say it was, Jane and Bill. So Jane and Bill have a conflict and we're very concerned about the safety of each of them but also everyone else in our office. Well, if I'm in charge of that kind of thinking, I'm going to make this a weapons-free zone. There's going to be no um, weapons allowed in this office building. So we're, we're removing the means for them to wage violence, to, to inflict violence upon one another. Now, of course, some are going to argue that, you know, you, you can never, <coughs> if you take away their weapons, you know, that they will revert to uh, using their fists or using things in the office as weapons and so that's that's a valid concern but the idea here is that if we remove the motive and they no longer 
want to inflict violence upon one another, then violent conflict arguably won't occur. If we can't remove the motive, but let's at least remove the means so that they can't actually inflict violence or severe violence on each other. And the third and final kind of strategy or tactic is to reduce the opportunities for that conflict to escalate into violence. So when you look at the news and you see UN peacekeepers with their blue helmets patrolling uh, the demilitarized zone between two warring parties, that's exactly the logic there. The logic is if we can put a third party in between the two parties that are at war or that are fighting and, and separate them, physically separate them, increase the distance between them, then the opportunity for them to actually inflict violence on each other is arguably has gone down. So I would say that um, your number one priority should try to remove the motive. What's fueling this conflict? What's fueling the grievance? What's making one person so angry that they want to inflict violence on the other party? If we can't address the motive, then let's at least reduce the means and opportunities for them to be violent. So here are three distinct tactics that you can apply in different contexts from the family to the international level to prevent violent conflict. Address the motive, the means, and the opportunities. And I should note that I've done uh, quite a bit of training in the past with police officers. And this is one of the things that I teach them uh, specifically about the opportunities. And I say, if you approach uh, two neighbors, maybe you get called to a, a neighborhood uh, dispute. You know, if you approach two neighbors who are fighting um, over the location of a fence between their properties, one of the th first things you should do is, you know, ask them to uh, each return to their own homes or at least to their front porch and increase the physical space between them. And by doing that, you're reducing the opportunity for them to attack each other. So physical separation is one way to reduce the opportunities for the conflict to escalate. So that's golden rule number two. Think of the motive, the means and the opportunities. Um, number three, be alert and responsive to the signs of rising tensions. Don't ignore them or hope they'll go away on their own. So I've already kind of mentioned that, but it's the it seems to be a human nature that <clears throat> when um, when there are signs of a problem and the signs first come up, and you can think of this maybe like with your own car might be a good example. Uh, imagine you're driving your car and you hear... Um, some kind of funny, you know, knocking noise from the front left tire. And you go, well, that's odd. I don't know what's causing that, but I'm just going <laughs> to pretend I didn't hear that and keep driving. And then by the end of that day, um, you know, there's a really serious noise when you go to turn, turn the corner coming from that tire and you take your car to the mechanic and the mechanic says, well, look at, you've got a very serious issue here. It's now going to cost you several thousand dollars. And if you would have brought this in a lot sooner, you know, we could have fixed your car for a hundred bucks and you could have prevented all these problems. And so it's the same kind of thinking that we often will be aware that there is a problem and there are signs uh, of rising tensions or a conflict and a conflict that's increasing. And that it's only after it's really gotten really serious that we say, whoops, we probably should have done something about this sooner. We probably should have addressed this a week ago or a month ago or or had Bill and Jane in our office for a sit down, you know, before they had gotten a fist fight at the water cooler. So to be an effective practitioner aiming to prevent conflicts, be alert to the signs of rising tensions and, and responsive to them. When you see they are there, take actions, take the appropriate actions. Okay, golden rule number four. Put your own personal safety first. If violence is imminent, disengage immediately and take protective measures. Um, what is the saying when you fly on the airplane and they're telling you about the mask that dropped down from the ceiling in, the, in case of a loss of pressure? They say, put your own mask on before helping others. <laughs> this is kind of the same thinking. <clears throat> 
Um, you're not going to be a very effective conflict resolution practitioner or a very effective brave one um, if you are injured or hurt or um, are unable to assist the party. So definitely consider your own safety. Uh, number five, reflect first and then respond. Don't just react. Stop, count to four, be present and mindful. This slows the exchange down and assists with the de-escalation. So what I'm talking about here is that in many cases, um, people have scripts that they run off of or patterns that they follow or ways of interacting with their coworkers or their family or whatnot that creates a conflict. And to prevent those conflicts, instead of just automatically spinning off quickly into rising tensions and the, and the conflict getting worse, is that we're trying to interrupt that cycle. We're trying to slow it down. And one way to do that is to, to not necessarily just respond the first thing that comes into your mind, but to pause and think first and say, well, if, is my response or is my action here going to contribute to the escalation of this conflict? And is there a different way for me to approach this? Golden rule number six, <clears throat> consider possible future scenarios or what we might call conflict trajectories from the mundane to the seemingly impossible and our preferred outcome for each one and be prepared for all possibilities. So in other words, you might recognize that there is a conflict, um, the signs are there, and you might help the parties to uh, take some actions to de-escalate that conflict, but you have to be realistic and say, well, you know, there's a, there's a small chance that my actions with the parties are actually going to make things worse and this conflict's going to uh, spike really quickly, and that's one possibility, and if that happens, then what am I going to do? How am I going to assist the parties? Or, you know, maybe this conflict, the actions, the agreement that they've reached today, maybe that means the parties haven't really addressed all of the causes of the conflict enough to make it go away for good and forever, but we bought a little time and I've got them into an agreement where, um, you know, at least they're not going to be at each other's throats this week or this week end or, or this whole month, but eventually there's a real possibility that this conflict will reemerge and escalate quickly. And so if I'm the conflict manager, what can I do well aware of that fact? What happens if that's the trajectory that this conflict takes? What will be my steps to help prevent that from occurring? So be aware that we don't necessarily know which direction the conflict's going to go in. We don't know if it's going to escalate. We don't know if it's going to escalate slowly or quickly. We don't know if it's going to go away forever necessarily. And that all of these different conflict trajectories or different scenarios are possible. And that myself as a conflict manager has to consider what might, what are, what are the most likely scenarios and what will I do in each scenario? Okay. Number seven, um, establish a set of agreed upon facts between all of the parties. Let me try to put this in real terms for you again. Um, let's go back to that scenario where there's two neighbors arguing over the placement of their fence on their property line. <clears throat> and so we now know that the cause of that particular conflict is a lack of information. Uh, we know that the incompatibility between them is that each has an interest to uh, maximize their own yard by pushing the fence as close to the other person's property line as possible. We know that they're so angry over this conflict that it's very likely that they've already had a fist fight and now we know that one of them has weapons and they're threatening their neighbors with death threats and so on and so forth. So the uh, possibility of real violent confrontation is uh, there and it's serious. So one way to help prevent that conflict from escalating and becoming a violent confrontation is to say, I understand 
that both of you gentlemen are in a dispute over the fence and where the fence should be located. And I understand both of you um, don't want the fence coming onto your own property. So you don't want your neighbor's fence on your, your side of the property line. Um, would this conflict be resolved? So this is really addressing the motive for it as a side note. Uh, would this conflict be resolved if you two could agree where the property line is, if we had a precise location? And I would presume that both of them would say, yep. Then I would say, well, look it. The only way we can all stand around here guessing where the property line might be, the only way to resolve this uh, with any amount of certainty is to have an outside professional survey company come in with their professional GPS equipment and whatever else they may use to uh, locate the property line for us and to clearly mark it. Do you guys agree that would be a good way forward to help manage this conflict? And I bet they would both say yes. Okay, well, let's look at the costs of that then. How about the two of you, um, you know, agree to splitting the cost 50-50 of having the professional surveyor? Okay, so there you go. That was, a, of course, a fictional example um, of how establishing a set of agreed upon facts between the parties can prevent the conflict from escalating. And that's just one example. You can probably think of others. Uh, the, the only side note, and I don't want to go too far off track here, the only side note that I need to mention is that as a mediator, you have to be very, very careful about suggesting solutions to the parties. And in that little fictional example I just gave, it, it was very much the, the conflict manager was uh, trying to direct the solution or direct the outcome. And ideally, you would hope that the parties might reach that same thinking or reach that same conclusion of their own accord. And you could, you could help them along a little bit and give them some hints, but you really can't be imposing your own solution onto the parties. And really, it has to come from their own thinking and their own problem solving. Um, so that's just a, a side note, a caution there. But I just gave that example um, to really just to help illustrate this point that if we want to address the motive of the conflict or the reason why people are fighting or what the reason why the conflict is occurring, I, we've talked about one thing is to improve communication. Another thing here is to establish some agreed upon facts. And if the facts are out there and both of them agree to the facts, um, then we can have the conflict maybe be resolved or prevented, if you will, and have it not escalate into something more violent. Golden rule number eight. Never be certain that what you think you know is complete or right. Nothing is certain until it is certain. So again, this kind of speaks to the, uh, to the optical illusion slide from earlier in this, in this conversation where, you know, we can, you can have five different parties in a conflict in the room and each of those five different parties are going to disagree on what the conflict's really over. And you are going to have your own, uh, kind of analysis or diagnosis of what the conflict's all about as well. And so that's six people in the room now. So there's six different people with six different opinions about what they think the conflict is about and how it could possibly be resolved. So as a professional, brave one, conflict manager helping other parties to resolve their conflicts, you have to be careful about your own assumptions and your own understandings. And you can't jump to conclusions. And you can kind of fact check in a way what you know or what you think you know by asking the parties. So imagine <clears throat> that they're on the platform and perhaps you've invited both party to, uh, to give an opening statement about what they feel the conflict is over. So party one talks for about 15 minutes on the platform and then party two talks for about 15 minutes and then you're starting to formulate your own opinion and you're so you reflect that back to them and you say 
if I understand this correctly, are you saying this conflict is primarily over the financial issues? I've heard you talk about several issues today of concern in your opening statements, but it seems to me that the financial issue is the key one or the central one. And so you just kind of bounce that back at the parties and you look for a validation or a confirmation. And what you might find, <clears throat> and maybe in your own mind, you think that it's really a money matter and money is uh, you know, important to so many people at the end of the day. And what you might find is that they both say, well, no, uh, you know what? This has nothing to do whatsoever with the money. This has to do with the way that I was treated last week and the way I've been treated ever since I started working here. And what, you know, I'm not concerned about the raise or the promotion or, or getting a, a bonus. Or the money is no, not that important. What's important to me is a matter of principle, the matter of fairness and getting an apology for the way I was treated. So as a brave conflict manager, if you heard both parties give their opening statement and you thought, huh, they're really, this conflict's all about the money and we can sort that out, help them sort it out pretty easily, you would be leading the parties then down a track that doesn't necessarily prevent the main conflict. So you might resolve the money issue, but the conflict still won't go away because you haven't addressed the main issue fueling the conflict. So you have to be careful about your own assumptions, thinking that you are certain about you know what's going on and how things can be resolved easily. So number eight, never be certain that, you th that what you think you know is complete or right. Number nine, <clears throat> um, this goes back to the establishing of the agreed upon facts, but uh, help assist the parties to identify very specific actions that will reduce or resolve the conflict based upon the agreed upon facts. So let me go back to my fictional example of the two neighbors fighting over their property line. Um, imagine in that conversation it surfaces that yes indeed they both the main issue that needs to be resolved is the location of the property line. So you can easily leave it at that and, and kind of walk away from the situation and say, well, congratulations, you guys, you spent an hour here on the platform and uh, you sorted it out. But ideally, you want them to take or to commit to some very specific follow-up steps or concrete actions. So you can say, you know, I'm, I'm proud of you guys for working through this uh, situation today. And I'm, I'm thrilled that you've uh, concluded that if we knew precisely where the property line is, this conflict would be resolved and, and any future conflicts around this are prevented. Now, let's take this to the next step. Let's create an agreement that has very concrete actions. And so there is built into the platform um, an agreement um, function where you can click on the left side and uh, there's a template that pops up. And at that stage too, it's helpful to remind the parties that some agreements are binding. In other words, um, once you agree to it, you'll be held accountable to it. And other agreements are non-binding. In other words, there's really no consequence for not following through uh, on, on your commitments to the agreement. So that that's an issue that we'll t we could talk about perhaps in another uh, uh, training session but for now I just want you to keep in mind that kind of the natural conclusion of the whole conversation is that you want them to get to the stage of creating a ideally a written agreement using the function on the platform the agreement function uh, uh, that has very specific concrete actions so you can even get very specific and say you know, the, we, we had this session on Thursday night. Uh, so Monday morning, Bill will phone, uh, you know, some survey companies for estimates or quotes. Uh, by, by Thursday morning, he will share all of those written quotes with, with the other party. Both parties agree by, you know, Friday afternoon to select. So you're, you're specifying who is doing what and you're putting in very specific 
timelines too, like day by day, um, who's doing what. Okay, so that's number nine. Get down into some very specific actions that will reduce or resolve the conflict. Okay, so I've alluded to this a few times, and now I want to change our focus and uh, drill down on communication. Communication is interesting because communication or a lack of communication is the can be a major cause of a conflict. And so communication or improving the communication thus becomes the key to its resolution. So the more that you can practice good communication skills and assist the parties to be better communicators, the likelihood that they will resolve their conflict uh, should increase. So good communication, why is it the key to resolution? Well, there are at least four or five reasons provided here. Uh, one, good communication, if, it, if they start having a good dialogue, it can help to build up the trust between the two parties. Secondly, um, good communication can help correct any misperceptions. Thirdly, it can increase understanding. And fourth, the task of generating solutions really only comes about through communication. So that last step I just mentioned, step nine, packaging up an agreement with very specific actions, um, coming up with the actions and the solutions in the next step, that involves talking back and forth. Well, what do we have to do? What are the steps we have to take and who's going to do them? So communication builds trust, corrects misperceptions, increases understanding and helps to generate solutions. So we need to be aware then that communication is both verbal and nonverbal. And uh, <clears throat> one estimate of this says that the verbal communication, in other words, what's actually said is only 10% of the message's meaning. And 90% of communication is embedded in nonverbal things, such as body language, facial expressions, and so on and so forth. So that's depicted in this pie chart on the right side of the screen. <clears throat> but we also have to be aware that communication is a cyclical process. In other words, it goes back and forth, involving speaking, listening, understanding, and then responding. So not surprisingly, because um, there's so many steps in the communication process, there are many spots for the cycle to break down. Communication is subjective. It's influenced by the culture and the context. So think about maybe you've had the opportunity to travel overseas to a different country and experience life in a different culture. Think of some of the different ways that different cultures communicate and the different gestures and how different gestures mean different things in different countries. Um, so if you're doing cross-cultural communication, uh, it can be more difficult because the way the words I use make sense to me, but they may not make sense to you, or they might mean different things in your culture. Um, it's subjective because of the context. So context distortions are possible, i.e. noise in the system can distort the message or slow its transmission. So think of the difference between uh, having a Skype call. Well, no, let's, let's, let's go to the example of um, let's imagine you're working on the brave platform and you know one of your parties is in a cafe or a coffee shop and there's music playing in the background and there's customers and there's other conversations whatever they say then their message is going to get distorted because there's all this other noise going on around them <clears throat> and if the other party on the other hand has their laptop um, in their home office and it's a nice quiet office, they've got no, no, the TV's not on in the background. There's less noise in the system, therefore their message will be more clearly communicated and more clearly understood. <clears throat> so you have to be aware of that then when working on the Brave platform that you might want to ask the parties to make sure that when the session occurs, that they ensure that they're in a private 
and quiet room without any disruptions or interruptions and other ambient noise and that that will assist in the communication process um, communication is determined in part by the method of transmitting the message ie the medium that the message flows through so again you know if you're uh, working on the brave platform you're, you're predominantly working with uh, a web camera and a microphone and if one of the parties chooses to mask their uh, face um, you know some of the nonverbal expression will be lost so you need to be aware of that and if you of course uh, you know if you were a mediator in a face-to-face -face setting where you could see the person's whole body posture are they slouching are they do they have their arms crossed and they look closed off and you know you can read more so um, you have to be aware that the communication is going to be determined um, whether your um, it'll be it'll be determined by the method of transmitting the message and a webcam will be very different from an in-person training so here's that communication process that I was just mentioning that cyclical process <clears throat> depicted uh, visually so we've got a woman on the left here who's the uh, message transmitter or what they call here the sender so she has to come up with a message in her brain and encode it and uh, based on her past experiences and her attitudes and her skills and her perceptions so a whole, whole bunch of psychological factors will determine how well she can formulate and send her message then she sends her message through the air in this in this particular example it looks like a face-to-face -face meeting and there might be noise in the system that disrupts the message so there's some co-workers up there and then the gentleman in the right uh, he's the receiver of the message so he has to be able to hear the message he has to be able to decode it and, and understand it and that's partially determined by his own experiences his attitudes his skills and his perceptions and per, I would add to that perhaps his cultural background and then in order to close the loop he needs to send a message back to her saying okay I hear what you're saying what you're saying is the money is not a problem but you really need an apology and then in the middle it just says that the message or the medium uh, it can be verbal or nonverbal written messages as, as in a word document email web or pictures so different mediums like I just mentioned on my last slide will affect the quality and uh, style of the communication and and its ease in being sent or encoded and decoded so on the notion of communication sometimes there can be uh, a rush maybe on the opening statement where a person comes in they've got a lot on their mind they have to do a lot of kind of throat clearing they might have to do some posturing and uh, they may take 15 or 20 minutes for their opening statement just to air out their grievances and get everything out on the table and they just want to spew a lot of information um, and I would say the general rule of thumb is that you want to go slow to go fast so that might sound counterintuitive but there is a lot to be said for slowing the conversation or the interaction down and I've already alluded to this in a previous slide where I noted that you don't want to go into autopilot you don't want to respond and react immediately and you can hear what the other person has said and you can pause and you can use some silence and you can take some deep breaths and you can really think through what is the best way for me to react or to respond to what has just been said and so by slowing down what happens is we can have a deeper and more meaningful conversation that gets to the very core of the problem rather than a more superficial discussion that overlooks the root causes so if party one lays out kind of 10 major grievances and party two including some of those grievances are framed as a personal attack on the other party and party two <clears throat> just automatically replies to all of the 10 personal attacks on them 
then the communication is not really helping to resolve or prevent the conflict from getting any worse because we're just dealing with the the um, the superficial level of personal attacks and the back and forth and you really need to pause and say well what's at the core of this what are the key issues and then let's drill down and really talk about each of those issues and, and talk about them in depth and really resolve them so go slow to go fast to improve communication seek to understand and clarify assumptions I've already talked about the danger of this so uh, shift your attitude to one of curiosity so instead of approaching the session um, from the perspective of I know what's going on here I know the solution etc etc you, you can shift your attitude to I'm not sure what I'm gonna hear today so this will be interesting and I'll see if it confirms or denies my own thinking about the situation so have a curious attitude ask a lot of questions so a key for communication is to ask questions it helps put the other person in a listening mode and when a person is really concentrating on listening it can reduce their physiological arousal which can help to de-escalate a tense situation and through asking lots of questions we know that important new info can surface as well and I'd almost be tempted to add a third bullet point to this where I would say by asking lots of questions we help to uh, clarify our understanding of the situation and I've alluded to that in a previous slide as well okay so after you ask all of those questions then you have to listen 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 and so um, there's a saying of course that we have two ears and one mouth for a reason and it's because we need to pay <laughs> a lot of us have that ratio uh, backwards where we want to be speaking all the time and we don't like to be listening or when we're listening uh, we're not really listening to the other person we're actually uh, daydreaming or thinking about how we'll reply or thinking about uh, taking a mental holiday <laughs> and thinking about you know what we're gonna have for dinner tonight so the art of active listening and this is a, a skill that can be just like learning to, uh, to to golf really well it's a skill that can be taught and it can be learned and you can practice it and continue to perfect it and it's quite difficult I would add and I would encourage you going forth from this point forward to uh, try to be an active listener and try to just be there um, as a non-judgmental open listener and so listening requires that we give the other person our full and undivided attention and we aren't simply waiting for our turn to talk or we're not taking a mental vacation as I just mentioned before use minimal encouragers to keep the forward momentum of the conversation going and to affirm that you are listening so minimal encouragers are small words like yes uh-huh right hmm okay and those small words they don't break up the flow or interrupt the other person um, but they just show the other person that you are there you're attentive you're paying attention and you're following along okay so thinking back to the circle or the cyclical communication process I showed you a few slides ago um, one aspect of being a good communicator is to complete the circle in other words you want to close the feedback loop by paraphrasing what you heard um, and this helps to establish the facts so in conclusion each of us has the ability to help prevent and resolve the everyday conflicts we face uh, it isn't always easy to do but with practice of the application of the tips presented here hopefully you'll achieve some great results